thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm here to ask this question. Can blockchain help us address the world's energy issues? Well, it's a quite complicated and loaded question, and so maybe it's easier to start with this question. What is the blockchain? So, imagine this example. Um, your neighbors come over and ask you to water their plants when they go on vacation, and in exchange for that, they will uh, uh, make you dinner after they come back. So, um, is there any issue with that? No, probably not. You trust them to follow through, and if they don't, you know where they live. So, another uh, example. You go to a coffee shop and buy a cup of coffee. Uh, how does it work? Well, both you and the owner of the coffee shop trust that the money that you use to buy the coffee uh, is genuine and that it can be used to buy other uh, commodities. But what happens if you need to um, trade something with somebody that you don't trust? And even worse, they don't trust you. Well, um, in that case, you could sign a contract and make sure that all the corner cases are uh, covered, and uh, so everything is made sure that it works out um, without that you need to trust the other um, party here. But then, who gets to keep the contract? If it's either of you, then the other could not be sure that the contract isn't um, changed after it is signed by both of you. Well, both of you could have a copy of the contract, but then it's still word, one word against the other if one party changes the contract. Well, what other solutions could you have? Um, you could bring in a third party who keeps the contract safe for you. But that means both of you have to trust the third party, and it gives the third party power over you, even though they are not concerned about what's in the contract. So, imagine this is a problem that many people have, and um, so what do you do with it? How can you create a system that has trust intrinsically built into it? Um, let's call this system that we imagine a shared ledger. Imagine it like a book where um, you put all the contracts one after the other in, and now we look at what kind of properties this ledger needs to have so that you can intrinsically trust it. So first of all, you need to be sure that nobody can tamper with it. Um, so, once a contract or a transaction or whatever information you put on the ledger is in there, you need to be sure that nobody can change it, and even if they could, that you need to be able to make sure that you can find out and detect that there has been tampered with uh, the ledger. And the second thing is, again, you don't want a single entity to have control over this ledger, because then they have power over everybody who puts information on there, and can give restricted access or withhold information. So no single entity should have uh, ownership of this ledger. Let me start addressing the second issue first. What kind of other technology do we have that um, is decentralized and has no single uh, ownership? Well, the internet is a good, good example. So let's start with a bunch of computers owned by all kinds of different people who are interconnected. And now we put this ledger in digitized form onto every single computer in this network. So everybody has a copy of it. Well, so now we, we have no single ownership, but what about the trust? Here, uh, some clever algorithm comes in that is called the consensus algorithm. Um, the consensus algorithm essentially makes sure that everybody on the network always has the same information, so when a new contract comes in, it uh, gets shared amongst all these computers, and everybody has the same information. And the other thing it makes sure is that every information that comes in gets kind of a watermark. So whenever you change it, you see that the watermark has all also changed. So you can make sure that once the information is on the ledger, um, you can detect any fraud in it. So how would that look in such a network? So let's assume that this red computer here um, has some faults. So maybe it's a hardware failure, or somebody has hacked it, or actually the owner of this computer does something malicious with it. Well, if a user of this network now asks this computer 
uh, for a specific kind of information. It can check the watermark and see if it's actually valid. So anything that's in the past can be verified. But what happens if your information that you're looking for is very recent and this computer just says, oh, I didn't receive it yet? Well, you could ask the other computers in the network. So um, as long as the, uh, most of the computers or a majority of them uh, in there is benevolent and doesn't try to, to um, do anything fraudulent, you can ask just a few of them and get the correct answer back. So in this case, um, you have implicit trust in this network because as long as you uh, ask enough uh, computers here, you always get the correct answer. So since we now have an architecture in place that we can trust, let's look at the other part of the problem. How does green energy trading work uh, in the, at the moment? So somebody who has a solar power plant or a wind farm uh, usually has to uh, have this, uh, the energy produced metered and then this data is put, simply speaking, into a spreadsheet. And from there, a third party comes in and audits this data and then creates certificates on top of it. And these certificates then can be bought by uh, users um, at a single point and uh, to, to make sure that the energy that they consumed actually is virtually green energy because they, they paid for the energy that came out of those sustainable energy sources. But since there's many hands involved and some steps are actually done manually, it's a slow process and it's very error prone. So how can we improve it? Well, let's replace this whole thing with a blockchain and plug the energy producers directly into this blockchain. So the data that is metered uh, from wind farms, solar panels is directly put onto the blockchain. So as soon as it is there, you can trust it that it's true and it verifiably stays the same. Um, and in comparison to, to the system before, where it's usually large utilities who can uh, pay for the auditing and certification, now everybody can participate. So even if you have a single solar panel on the rooftop, um, you could link it to the blockchain and trade your energy with your neighbor, with somebody uh, on the other side of town, or even uh, all across the country. But why stop with trading just between humans that, with the data that is put on a blockchain? You could link up a smart thermostat or an electric car, and they know exactly when they need energy because they need to keep the temperature in the house or they need to charge their batteries. So they could actually buy the, the energy themselves from the blockchain because the uh, data is all there and it's all digital. Now, um, so far we only looked at the uh, blockchain as a dumb log that just gives you guarantees about um, verifiability and, and trust. But what if we close the feedback loop and make it kind of intelligent? So triggered based on the, the energy that comes in, um, you could control um, the endpoints again. So for example, if there's too much energy produced because there's so much wind right now, you could then have the, uh, the blockchain tell one of the wind farms, hey, curtail your production because we have too much right now. Or on the other hand, uh, you could tell electric cars when it's a good time to, uh, to charge the battery because energy production is high or prices are low. And so you can close the feedback loop and everything is, uh, is automated now and there's no human in the loop anymore. And so that means that now you can optimize this system to your heart's content or as, as much as possible since there's, uh, everything is digital and, and automized. Why do we not use this in a widespread way right now? Well, there's a little pr a problem with it. This consensus algorithm with the current state that we have is very energy hungry. So Bitcoin as kind of the worst offender here um, has an energy consumption that is similar to that of Denmark. So if we want to get an eco-friendly solution to our problem, then this is certainly not the way to go. And the other problem that we have, um, everything works fine if you just have a couple of computers that uh, are distributed and distribute the ledger, 
But what happens if you not have 10 servers, but 100, or even 1,000, a million servers? This comes to a halt. Th these systems just crawl when they are scaled up. For example, Bitcoin has a transaction speed of tra seven transactions per uh, second. If your credit card company would have the same throughput, you could probably have three purchases in a lifetime confirmed if everybody participates in it. And even other faster current um, blockchains are in the, uh, been, uh, in the ballpark of hundreds to maybe a thousand transactions per second. And for example, Visa has a throughput of about 50,000 uh, transactions per second. So you need to at least get to this level, if not more, if you want to do energy trading. And so scaling is, is a big problem that needs to be solved. So now coming back to my original uh, question, can blockchain help us address the world's energy issues? Well, maybe. If those scalability issues and energy consumption issues can be solved, um, blockchain is uh, currently still in its, in its uh, cradle and we, we don't really know uh, what its actually capabilities are. So, um, time will tell if we can solve these issues and if we can make it faster, uh, then it can probably help, but we need time to see if we actually can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and thank you for explaining the uh, fundamentals of blockchain to us. I'd now like to call on Theo Stratopoulos, who is an as uh, Associate Professor in Information Systems at the School of Accounting and Finance. Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Theo Stratopoulos, and my research is on emerging technologies, uh, particular adoption of information of uh, emerging technologies. And the question that I'm going to try to answer uh, today is from a technology adoption standpoint, what is the role that blockchain can play in a distributed energy solution? Um, as a way of introduction, as I was thinking about this pre uh, presentation, I remember that at some point I had read an article about a star that had a very weird behavior. And the, one of the explanations was that it's possible that this star may be covered completely like a solar panel. Uh, Power-hungry aliens may have covered the entire planet with solar panels to harvest energy. And when I was talking to, my, to a friend of mine who was Star Trek fan, he said that, yes, of course, have you seen the episode? I told him, come on, you know, my favorite uh, science fiction is Cowboy Bebop, not uh, Star Trek, so I cannot, I don't, I'll take your word on this, your word on this one. So the next thing that I needed in order to understand how this, uh, that my presentation will fit with the whole issue was some uh, information, what do we mean when we're talking about uh, distributed energy, etc. And Professor Kessar, Srin Savan, told me, gave me uh, a link to an article that he has written, beautiful, nice article for people like me who don't know a lot about technology. It makes perfect sense what he described, the idea which is similar to your presentation on how homes will be connected and uh, they will be able to trade energy, etc. And this brought me to the next point. Now, having this kind of foundation, I can bring it into the area that I'm interested in. From a technology adoption standpoint, what does this mean? And what I realized now, that we're not talking about a single technology. In order for this uh, idea of shared energy to work, we need to have smart grid technology, Internet of Things, energy storage, what Linda presented, renewable energies like uh, solar panels, wind energy, uh, geothermal, all kinds of energies that we have seen, machine learning, uh, existing enterprise systems, and blockchain on top of them. So the question that I'm going to tackle again is from 
a technology adoption standpoint, where are we standing? Uh, when we're talking about an, an emerging technology, from an adoption standpoint, it will follow an approximately bell-shaped distribution. Approximately. And the idea here is that at the very beginning, only the risk takers will adopt the technology, and they will adopt the technology even at the point when it's still at the experimental stage, there is no clear business benefit associated with this technology. We're talking about the innovators at the very left. The second group, the early adopters, is a critical one. Because this is the group of people who are thinking. They are learning from the mistakes of the first group, and they are trying to see if there is a way of monetizing the solution. If they are successful, their uh, decision will define whether the technology will enter the mass adoption stage or die. So the, the line that separates, uh, I don't know how to do this, I'm like, oh, sorry, that's not what I, uh, the line that separates the early adopters with the early majority is a critical line. And what, that's the area where I'm trying to concentrate. That's the line that I'm trying to predict. In order to make this kind of uh, predictions, I'm using proxies. I'm trying to figure out how people reveal their preferences. And there are many ways that can capture indirectly what people think, what people, how people feel about an emerging technology. A simple one that I strongly recommend that you try is the Google Trend. Because the Google Trend tells you how people, what kind of searches people are doing. Other ways it can look is that by looking at magazine articles, book titles, startups, ref, uh, IPOs, references to emerging technologies in the annual reports of companies, VC funding, all of them. And my idea is that if I find the hype, the sort of the point where each one, one any one of them, sort of reaches the maximum point. This tends to coincide with the transition from the early adoption to the mass adoption of the technology. Okay? I have tried all of them, and the best results that I've been getting are based on book titles. So what I'm going to show you from now on, results based on book titles. And I'm going to start with a technology which is mature. And for those of you who are old, uh, at least my age, <laughs> uh, you know about enterprise resource planning systems, and you know that the mass adoption for this technology started around 1999-2000. Number of book titles spiked, reached its peak around this time. Okay? What about the rest of the technologies that we mentioned? Here we're talking about smart grids. According to the number of book titles, the spike is approximately around 2011, 12, 13. What about Internet of Things, the spike is around 2014. What about energy storage? The spike here is sooner. It was around 2009, 2010. What about machine learning? Around 2013, 2014. What about blockchain? Are we there yet? That's the title of the article in The Economist, that's a similar article from Coindesk, which means at this point, when it comes to blockchain technology, we don't know whether we are two years, one, two years, or ten years away from the point that blockchain technology will reach the mass adoption. I don't know. And at this point, the question that I ask myself, why not? And some of the issues that I think, one of the technical issues that I'm thinking is that, which blockchain? If we're going to move to mass adoption, which one is blockchain? I just have a list here of all different uh, flavors of blockchain which are available. The second one, which is kind of like simplified in your presentation, how are you going to connect blockchain to the existing systems? The integration of blockchain technology to an existing ERP system, it's not going to be an easy thing. Uh, we already know from prior attempts in the past to do this kind of integration. I'm an economist by trade, by trade, so the area that's more interesting to me is the issue of price stability. And if we're going to use a cryptocurrency in order to facilitate this kind of trade that we're talking about, in other words, if we're going to have the smart contracts to facilitate this kind of trade, price stability is important. What you're looking here is, I just wrote a simple application in R, 
collect data from different sources. And what I have is the price of Bitcoin in dollars. I have price per gallon for uh, gasoline, price per uh, kilowatt for electricity, and the, the first three are in dollars. And as far as, as, far as no, we complain about the price of, of electricity and the price of gas of fluctuate a lot, but relatively speaking, their fluctuation is little. The moment that I convert their prices in Bitcoin, uh, you may not be able to appreciate it with this graph, but here's what happens if I create an index. If we had decided to price gasoline or electricity in Bitcoin, that could have been the range of prices we're talking about. Because what you're doing is that in addition to the fluctuation because of the commodity, you have a fluctuation that's introduced because of speculators entering the Bitcoin market. And from an economic standpoint, the reason that you have this problem is because when you introduce a cryptocurrency, ahead of time you decide what's going to be the supply of money. For example, for Bitcoins, we know ahead of time it's going to be 21 million Bitcoins. But this means that if you have fluctuations in the demand, all the, all the effect will be absorbed in price. Now, there is a solution to this one. You can have cryptocurrency which is pegged in dollars or from a more, uh, from an economic standpoint, it's called the Hayek money. I need at least a couple of hours to explain you how Hayek money works. And for pegged, uh, trying to peg currencies to uh, dollars, I was just going to give you an example. In 1992, the Central Bank of England pegged the British pound. George Soros realized that there's an opportunity to make money here. He made about, how much was it, Jim? $2.5 billion in a month. So if you think that a company that introduces a cryptocurrencies can truly peg, a, peg their currency against speculators, uh, I, I'm not convinced. The last point that I want to mention is that I believe that blockchain and cryptocurrencies is a truly revolutionary technology. I do believe, because the potential are huge. My question when we're talking about energy solution, what is the element that makes blockchain the technology that we need to introduce within the distributed solutions? Can we achieve the same result with just a good old-fashioned relational database? Why do we need a blockchain? Who, who is the party that we don't trust? Uh, why do we need decentralization? Can we achieve all the benefits that were described by all the speakers since the morning by using just a good old-fashioned relational database. That's my closing point. Thank you, Theo. Um, our next uh, speaker is Amber Scott. Now, Amber is the founder and chief AML Ninja for Outlier Solutions, Inc. And if like you, you said, what is a chief AML ninja? Well, AML, I found out, means anti-money laundering. So I am really looking forward to what Amber has to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would generally describe what I do as every day as uh, being a big compliance nerd. So most of my day-to-day -day is working with companies. We work with a lot of companies in the blockchain and Bitcoin space and we try to keep them out of trouble. Um, my title is much cooler than I am. Um, I don't work for any government or government agency. Um, I'm unarmed. I'm really dealing with paperwork, not tackling people and taking them down. I'm gonna start with a couple of hefty disclaimers. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Please don't interpret anything I say as legal advice, um, nor am I an accountant, nor do I represent any government or government agency. Um, I'm not gonna endorse any specific blockchain or blockchain project. Um, except maybe Bitcoin, which I probably openly do a lot. Um, 
And if you have any questions, just because of the, the anti-money laundering bit, if you have any questions about a specific situation within your project or your company, pretty, pretty please, um, if it involves potential criminal activity, uh, wait until later and come and see me. I will stick around for a bit during the reception. And what I mean by that is sometimes I get questions in a public forum that are things like, this thing happened with this particular guy, Bob Smith. I think he's shady. Should I report it? Um, if you think so, the answer is probably yes, but uh, you don't want to say something like that in a more public forum. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what I think is the fundamental point of tension between technology and regulation generally. And I don't think that this is specific to blockchain technology, but I think it's really exacerbated within the blockchain space. So we have a little two-by-two two model that talks about how fast does it get to market. And when we're talking about tech, things shift pretty fast. When we're talking about regulation, stuff is very slow to shift. Um, the other piece of that is how universal is it? When you deploy technology, you can deploy something instantly, and it's everywhere in the world. When you're talking about regulation, it's global. And where I think this gets fascinatingly exacerbated is when we talk about the properties of blockchains. And, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the Bitcoin blockchain because I think you get into some of the blockchain ideals that don't necessarily exist for all of blockchains in the world. There are different iterations of blockchain. Um, and what I mean by that is specifically open, decentralized, permissionless, censorship resistant. And those things are features, they're not bugs. But damn, do they make it hard to regulate. Um, it is not what regulation was designed to do. And the vast majority of the time, when we hear something in our context about a country having banned um, a technology or a company having banned the concept, for instance, you'll read a lot lately about the US has banned ICOs, so initial coin offerings. That didn't happen. Um, what they did is zero change. They applied existing law to new technology and made it very uncomfortable for a lot of the technologists to operate within that space, for better or for worse. Um, when it comes to our regulatory solutions, I, I always say good regulation is hard to find. And so in my day-to-day -day work, I'm spending time helping companies do what they need to do so that they can do compliance um, and innovate within their space. And the other piece of that is that I spend a lot of time talking and thinking about what good regulation could potentially look like. So at its ideal, everything that you're doing is going to do two things. It's going to meet your regulatory requirement, and it's going to help you mitigate your risk, which presumably is what regulation intends to do. But quite often, you end up working in one of these two suboptimal quadrants. So you're either doing what you need to do to meet your regulatory requirement, or doing what you need to do to mitigate whatever risk it is you're dealing with. Um, and unfortunately, most of the time, probably not both. And although regulation and technology have all of these differences, at their core, they're really looking to do the same thing, which is to solve real-world problems. So with that as a basis, I want to talk about what we're looking at from energy projects right now. So there is a lot of collaboration within things that are considered to be either regulatory sandboxes. Um, and what I mean by a regulatory sandbox is a place where the regulator has said, you can do a limited use project. Um, you're going to work within certain parameters. And what we've seen lately is that there's really a timeline attached to that as well. Um, or there are a lot of projects that are happening within unregulated markets. And so some of those examples um, that, that have just flashed up, they're, they're just different pieces where you'll see within the Canadian and North American markets a lot of the sandbox type projects because we are a highly regulated environment. Where in other places that tend to be um, less regulated, more open to new technology um, in, in a way that isn't necessarily as controlled, you can see some bigger projects. There are also very different challenges, generally speaking, in each of those markets. I think when you're looking at a project in this space, there are some considerations, both in terms of compliance and technological, that are incredibly important. Um, the regulators in any particular jurisdiction, who are they? How do you approach them? Um, have they generally taken a punitive approach? Have they generally taken a collaborative approach? 
are there existing structures that would allow you to play within those markets? So is there a regulatory sandbox? Is there an environment that would let you interact with that regulator um, in a way that's um, that helpful in terms of fostering innovation? One of the questions that I find myself asking a lot lately when we talk about blockchains and tokens is what problem does it solve? And I, I think that's an incredibly important problem and I see a lot of fear of missing out. I see a, a lot of companies that are asking questions like, how do I implement a blockchain? Uh, look at my business, tell me where we implement a blockchain, how do we throw a blockchain at it? It's not always a great answer. Um, as much as blockchain has some of those beautiful properties, like allowing people to interact trustlessly um, and exchange digital information, there are a lot of limitations to that as well. Um, it can be costly. It can add complexity. Right now, there are far more active blockchain projects than there are coders who know how to work on those blockchain projects. And so we've seen a lot of things that are messes. We're going to see way more messes. Uh, I think one of the most apt comparisons that I've heard made is uh, Elizabeth Stark did a really great talk where she talks about blockchain today being very much like the internet in 1995. Um, quick show of hands, who used the internet in 1995? Who used the internet in 1995 for something other than email or pornography? <laughs> what did you use it for? I'm just super curious. Website. Awesome. Awesome. So the, there's, yeah, there's foresight. Um, for the rest of us, we have no idea how this is going to develop. We have no idea what this is going to look like. If you had told me in 1995 that I would have a device in my pocket that wouldn't cost a million dollars, that would me allow me to access all sorts of information in the world, um, it would be tiny, it would have a battery that wasn't burning a hole through my pocket, it would seem like science fiction to me. Um, it could read things to me. So I think that eventually when we look at what blockchain is going to look like, it's going to be less an idea of how do I throw a blockchain at it, and more a problem that's solved where blockchain is running in the background and we're not really seeing or thinking about blockchain. At their core, technologies should really be solving problems. And so I, I can't stress enough that if a blockchain uh, doesn't solve your problem, then it's probably not the best idea to throw a blockchain at it, um, especially at this point. It is, it is very new, immature technology. Um, and. I, I think that's important to remember. Um, there are very few people, like I said, that are out there that can competently work on these projects. That said, there are a ton of brilliant open source projects that are happening right now. There are a ton of free educational materials, of free collaborative materials. So if you want to become involved in the blockchain space, um, if you want to become involved um, in coding and contributing to open source projects, the only barrier to entry to that is do you have a keyboard, do you have the internet, do you know how to use those things? Um, and if you do, you can uh, start today, no salesperson will call, um, no invitation got lost in the mail, you're all invited to the party. And I'm, uh, I'm going to end there and, yeah. But uh, definitely open to questions. Is anybody working on blockchain projects right now? Just a curiosity. You are? Okay. The, but, but no one in, like no one in the audience has on the go blockchain projects. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Then, uh, then yeah, hit us up with questions. Thank you, Amber. And, and particularly around the uh, point of Blockchain is a technology solution to a problem, but it has to be the best solution to that problem. It's not just a tool we go waving around trying to solve everything with it. I'd now like to call on Merrick Laskowski, who is the program chair and adjunct professor at the Blockchain Hub at the Schulich School of Business at York University. Merrick? So I actually like this picture, uh, you know, uh, to, to sort of some points that were made earlier. It looks like, uh, you know, this is from a, a tabloid in the UK. 
Uh, you know, certainly sensationalism sells. We've heard today that, you know, Bitcoin uses the same energy as a small country and this sort of stuff. So I like this picture because it looks like Bitcoin is sort of raining from the sky and, and sort of destroying the world down here. And so, so one, one question that, you know, sort of an open question, you know, as was mentioned, uh, blockchain itself and Bitcoin being an example of that is a very nascent technology. So we're sort of right now living history. It's kind of unprecedented, uh, you know, uh, what's happening right now. And um, I think there's a little bit of hyperbole. One thing I do want to correct sort of off, off, the, off the hop here at the start is that, you know, it's often sort of quoted or thought that, you know, Bitcoin has a very low transaction threshold, meaning that the number of things it can handle at a time. And uh, what I want to suggest is that, you know, this energy that's consumed by Bitcoin, the energy that's put into there is actually the security guarantee of Bitcoin, meaning that to get twice the security, we would have to burn twice the power to get increase the transaction uh, throughput of Bitcoin. Uh, it doesn't necessarily scale the same way, right? So there's technological solutions that are you know, being worked on to, uh, to scale it without, uh, you know, doubling or quadrupling or whatever the, the power consumption. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so one of the questions I want to answer is, you know, whether, whether you know, blockchain and, and Bitcoin are, uh, are friend or foe to, uh, to green energy. And so perhaps we'll try to answer some of that through some slides here. I'm going to, uh, I think that, uh, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain were explained by some of the other, you know, panelists earlier quite well. So I won't, I won't dwell on these uh, sort of explanatory slides uh, too long. <laughs> Uh, the key takeaway, uh, in my opinion, of, uh, of what blockchain delivers is uh, consensus in an otherwise uh, trustless peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. And, you know, why is this uh, interesting or important in, in sort of today's uh, world? I mean, we're looking at the news, we see, uh, you know, big corporations, <laughs> example Facebook, right, which are sort of playing fast and loose with, uh, with consumers' data, right, these sort of ideas. So, I, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, both consumers are waking up and, and you know, governments and other folks are waking up to this idea that, you know, perhaps a, uh, a, a solution that no one controls, a network that nobody truly controls, i.e. a peer-to-peer -peer network, does have some, uh, I would say, nice uh, properties in that, um, you know, uh, there, there's no central party that uh, can, can necessarily exploit that network, uh, you know, at the cost of the, the common users, right, like us. Um, so just a little bit of a sort of funny, pithy, if you will, uh, explanation of what a, what a blockchain is uh, in, the, in the original Bitcoin white paper is explained as a chain of blocks, right, hence, hence blockchain, that's uh, where the name came from. But in, in a more, you know, in a more uh, uh, sort of, I would say, rigorous, uh, you know, explanation, or this is sort of the takeaway. Uh, that, uh, that the way I describe it is a blockchain is a distributed or decentralized ledger or database in which self-interested maintainers compete to find the next block in the chain, right? Meaning, meaning whoever gets to decide to add new data into this, into this database. Now, I know there's probably a lot of engineers in the audience today, right? Maybe some of you have studied distributed systems, right? So, you know, those of you probably realize that, you know, from, from an engineering perspective, there's really not a lot new in blockchain. I get that pointed out to me quite a bit. It's like there's really kind of nothing new here. It's more of how these, uh, these cryptographic primitives and, and distributed network ideas are being applied, right? Uh, so it, uh, it's really the application and the rethinking of, you know, how, how, this, uh, how these uh, technologies are applied. And I, I think that, you know, blockchain is sort of an interdisciplinary uh, endeavor, right? It brings together, you know, uh, computer science, uh, distributed systems theory, uh, economics, game theory, right, and, and, and other user experience, right, other, uh, other facets as well. So it's inherently interdisciplinary, I would, I would argue. Um, so there's this idea of, uh, of uh, proof of work that have been, has been mentioned, and really uh, what it's solving in a distributed system sense is, uh, is in a peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, untrusted way, choosing a leader within a network to, to add data uh, to, uh, to this uh, ledger or database, right? Where there's certainly other schemes that have existed for, you know, 20, 40, maybe even 50 years, right, in, in distributed systems to, you know, decide which computer in a network gets to take over leadership for that, that brief time slice, and then this moves on. So but, uh, what proof of work does is it lets, uh, you know, a group of untrusted, uh, unknown to each other individuals participate in such a network. Um, does anybody know what this, uh, what this creature here is in the, in the bottom right. Does anybody know what that critter is? No, no guesses? 
This is, this is actually a honey badger. You knew it, you knew it. Of course, she, she, Amber knew it. But no, this is actually a honey badger, and it's actually one of the few creatures that will, be, that will steal a kill from a lion. If there's a YouTube video, if you Google it, honey badger steals kill from a lion. And these are extremely vicious beasts and something that you really kind of don't want to mess with. And this is sort of the, the spirit animal, if you will, of, of, uh, of Bitcoin, and I think by association, blockchain as well. In that, uh, you know, the, the part of the purpose of this is it's a, it's a network that's sort of built uh, with, uh, with sort of an adversarial uh, type model in, in how, how, it's, uh, you know, how it sees itself in the world as, as in a world of adversaries and, uh, and framed sort of as a, as a very resilient system. Um, so, you know, I, I won't uh, spend time dwelling on this sort of argument of, you know, what's centralized, decentralized, and distributed, but what I do want to point out is that what's kind of important here Regardless of the network to topology, right, we may argue that, you know, the Bitcoin network looks either decentralized or looks more like a mesh distributed. I, I think what's more important is to, is to really consider who owns these computers, right? Even though, you know, I suppose Facebook, right, might be considered to be a distributed system and that they have computers all over the world, there's a centralized ownership of, of all those computers. Whereas, you know, in a blockchain, we've got a network uh, essentially like BitTorrent or, you know, one of these, uh, you know, sort of you know, underground type networks where, where really nobody controls it and, and moreover governments have a tough time playing, you know, whack-a-mole trying to, to stop these things. And I think, you know, certainly censorship resistance uh, is, is, one, uh, is one facet that's, uh, that's really interesting about these, uh, these networks. So, uh, you know, so I'm here to talk, sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how blockchain can be used to uh, incentivize uh, green and, and renewable energy and smart energy and these kind of networks. And I just wanted to make a little bit of a point about you know what what money is and why why people value what they what they value, right? So again, I'm going to quiz the crowd again. Amber, you probably know the answer to this. Does anybody know what this this picture here is of in the in the bottom right? Anybody seen this before? I'm guessing I'm guessing no. Again, right? Blockchain very interdisciplinary, right? Sort of sort of thing. So no one no one quite knows it all. This is actually a picture of giant stone discs on the island of Yap, and uh, and the, the sort of the prehistoric society there used these discs as a form of money, and they are actually, they are actually too large to, to move. So no doubt in this community, people just sort of decided, okay, well, this is Joe's rock, this is, this is Merrick's rock, this is Amber's rock. And really what, what money is, is it's a form of social consensus, right? I mean, uh, until recently, you know, we valued this yellow stone as being extremely valuable. More recently, we, we, you know, we value these, these pieces of paper that, uh, you know, that we sort of pass around, right? And I often do a demo. I don't have any cash with me right now. I often do a demo where I pull a bill out of my hand, crumple it up, and throw it. But I always, I always go get it, right? I always go pick it up after. So I guess, I don't know if that says more about me or about money. But in any case, the, you know, the, the point is that, you know, money is whatever people agree is money, right? So, um, so some people might say that, you know, uh, with, uh, with Bitcoin, we sort of created value out of thin air, right? Uh, and... Um, well, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that in a minute about value creation out of seemingly, seemingly nowhere. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, incentivization using, using tokens, right? To be able to create uh, a token or some, you know, some piece of information that people value and they, they pass around a network. So I want to speak a little bit about, you know, my involvement with, uh, with the blockchain hub that's, uh, that's a community organization that, uh, that grew out of the Bergeron Center for, uh, for Engineering, um, or sorry, was it? Bergeron, Enter well, anyway, the best center there at, at the Lausanne School of Business. I forget what the acronym is for. But um, so I'm here with the, with the blockchain hub with Ophelia and Omid over there. If you guys want to just raise your hands, uh, if you guys want to. So it's a community organization that runs, uh, you know, different educational programs for, for folks to, to learn about blockchain and also other technology. So if you're curious after, sl slight plug, right? If you're curious after, come, come talk to uh, uh, Ophelia and, and Omid if you're interested in, in the programs. And one of the things that we're, we're doing within this uh, community uh, organization, the Blockchain Hub, is we're trying to incentivize the, the community, our former graduates and also people that are, you know, maybe haven't uh, gotten into the community yet to sort of, you know, promote uh, a feeling of, uh, you know, camaraderie and, and, and helpfulness amongst the, the members. And so what we're, we're really proposing here is that the blockchain hub using something called a, called a smart contract. So I don't know if that's a term that was defined earlier. I don't think it was, right? So I'll sort of demystify this term smart contract you might have heard, right? So all a smart contract is, is it's a, it's a computer program whose, whose state and execution uh, of that program is, is managed by a blockchain. So again, it's a decentralized network 
where uh, you know all the computers, if you will, sort of execute this program at the same time, and, the, and, the, and by virtue of this notion of consensus, uh, that the uh, the state of the program is known to all participants at, at any one time. So it's a the idea is that it's a program that's very difficult to censor, and and you know there's no central server that you can take down to, or no no company that you could sue out of existence in order to shut this application down, right? Due to the dual nature of technology, right? This can be used for good. This can be used for evil, right? As sort of Amber alluded to earlier, right? We try to stay on, on the side of uh, good for sure. And, and by the way, on that topic, nothing I'm saying today should be construed as financial or legal advice at all. This is sort of just off the cuff comments. So anyway, uh, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned, is, is you know, foster community participation. So the idea is that using a smart contract, the blockchain hub will issue a series of, uh, of tokens, right? You can think of these tokens as effectively coupons, like e-coupons, or Canadian tire dollars effectively, right? But sort of virtual Canadian tire dollars. And the idea is we're gonna distribute these tokens to uh, you know, sort of prominent members within our community, ones that we sort of already trust and we know that they're kind of good people. And the idea is that they're gonna use them to effectively tip or re reward what we would consider positive behavior in the community, which would be you know, community members uh, helping each other with different projects and, you know, teaching each other, you know, tips about blockchain and, you know, solving each other's problems and this sort of stuff. So these tokens will be passed around to reward, you know, com community members will reward each other. And uh, what we're going to use these tokens for, and, you know, Amber, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but, you know, my opinion is that these wouldn't, could not be considered securities any more than, you know, you know, Canadian tire money or a coupon could be considered securities and that all that these coupon, all these tokens can be used for is to then trade in to get discounts on future course offerings, if you will, right? So it's a basically a discount system. So this is one way that we can use a token system to, to incentivize some, some type of behavior. Oops, there we go. So this is great, Merrick, but you know, where are the use cases, right? I, I keep getting asked that. I was being asked that throughout 2017, uh, and, and so I'll sort of explain this with a little bit of a story. Uh, in, uh, in late 2016, me and my, uh, you know, co-founder of, of, the, of the blockchain lab at the Schulich School of Business wrote a paper about supply chain traceability using blockchain. Uh, this, this, I, this was mentioned earlier uh, by another panelist as well. And, and at the time, you know, in, in business, by the way, I'm in a business school now, right? I wear an engineering ring, but I wound up in a business school. And, uh, you know, we were continually being asked, you know, what, what's, what's the use of blockchain? Why? you know, what's interesting about this. And so we'd, we'd explain Bitcoin to people, what Bitcoin is, and invariably, remember this was 2016, we would, we would get the response back like, isn't Bitcoin used to buy drugs on the internet, right? And then, you know, we could, we could never really get past that sort of discussion, right? Like, I mean, today in 2018, it's now traded on the Chicago, you know, mercantile exchange. It's sort of a, a big deal now, fairly institutionalized. And so the point was that throughout 2017, there were all kinds of proof concepts being incubated internally, right, being trialed out uh, within, you know, various organizations in the world. And early, so an example of which would be in early 2018, the, the wraps, the, the wrapping was sort of taken off this IBM Maersk, uh, you know, collaborative project, consortium project to produce uh, a blockchain solution for, for supply chain. Uh, and, and logistics tracking using blockchain. So that was something that, that was in, in basically an incubation for a year before they un unveiled it, right? So I think similarly with these energy projects, I'm gonna mention a couple, some of them I'm involved with, some of them not, I'm not involved with, that are you know, presently sort of, I would say, incubating and in proof of concept mode. And I think by, by next year, right, you know, we're gonna be saying, oh yeah, those are the use cases of blockchain. And then maybe in five years, no one's gonna talk about blockchain anymore, just the same way we don't talk about TCP IP anymore. Right, and, and I, I like that analogy, right? I like the analogy about the early internet for a couple of reasons. One being uh, that, uh, you know, TCP IP famously doesn't scale, right? If we traveled back in time 30 years, people say, this will never work, the internet will never work because TCP IP doesn't scale, right? But here we are, you know, in 2018, we can stream high, high definition video over the internet and, you know, the point is that engineers chipped away at these problems over the last 30 years and it just, it just works, right? So I think, I, my, my hope is, my thought is that, you know, a similar process, blockchain will undergo sort of a similar process. And, and to, uh, to Amber's earlier point as well, uh, you know, about early internet, uh, you know, folks that remember those days, you know, I, I go around and I see a lot of the blockchain projects. There are some good ones, right, but I see a lot more pets.com than I see amazon.com, right, t today. So I, I think that, you know, those, those uh, analogies are apt on a number of different levels. So let's, let's jump into some, some use cases and, and talk about some use cases. So carbon credits, right? Carbon credits is sort of kind of a, 
maybe an obvious one that people have, you know, most people have about, you know, 30 minutes after about hearing about blockchain, right? Blockchain and Bitcoin create value out of thin air, right? The value of Bitcoin literally kind of came from zero up to, you know, 18,000 US and now it's back down to seven. Who knows where that's going to go? But, you know, carbon credits are, you know, a, a token, something that people value that literally somebody decided to create out of thin air, right? Not, not too long ago, right? So these ideas, I think, are sort of would, would rhyme, like these are ideas that rhyme and I think this is sort of like a, if you will, a marriage made in, in heaven, tech heaven, if you will, right? This notion of, uh, you know, being able to track things like carbon credits on, on a distributed ledger that, that, again, no one controls, right? Because I think, uh, uh, you know, as a business, at a business school, uh, you know, lots of folks come talk to us and they, they sort of give us their thoughts about blockchain. I think one of the, you know, I, I used to, coming as from the engineering background, I used to hate buzzwords, right? Because buzzwords are so imprecise. Like, why would you say cloud when you mean, you know, a virtualized server that's off your premises. That's so much more precise, right? But, you know, now that I'm in business school, I wrap buzzwords around me like a warm blanket because, you know, I think at the end of the day, buzzwords convey a lot of information in a very sort of concise, pithy way. And I think blockchain and distributed ledgers are a little bit like that. And, and um, so we'll, uh, so I guess we'll, that, that's my point about carbon credits, actually, is this, this is, you know, something that people are thinking about. This is not my project. I just want to make that clear. This is a project that's uh, sort of ongoing, uh, just, just starting off uh, to, uh, to track carbon credits using, using blockchain. And moreover, this is, this is something that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want a Google or a Facebook or any individual government sort of running this show, right? I, I think that that's one of the selling points, if you will, of blockchain is that instead of, you know, if we wanted to establish a carbon credit system amongst us, right, we'd say, well, I'll run the server and you guys connect to my server and I've got the version of the truth. And then, you know, Amber might say, well, I'll run this, she'll run the server and we'll all connect to her, right? And so we degenerate into this argument over who controls what and who does what, where, 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 I, where I think blockchain fits in and what it solves is it solves this entire argument by saying we'll have a network that no one controls and it's sort of this digital commons that we can all sort of connect to and use. I think what I'm hearing from actual practitioners and business people, although that sounds like a very simple thing, uh, that, that's actually a very powerful idea, right? That, that no one person owns it or we're not paying, let's say for example, IBM to run it and then one day when we stop paying them, they pull the plug and down go the carbon credits. We just lost the carbon credits, right? So I think it does solve some of these things nicely. Anyway, that's carbon credits. Uh, other, other ideas, right, that were mentioned earlier, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, tokenizing energy. Uh, uh, the, the TMX, Tor uh, Tor uh, Toronto Mercantile Exchange, is actually right now uh, piloting and trialing uh, trading natural gas using a blockchain. So that's not something, that's something that, you know, might, might, you might have seen in a press release or on the sort of dark corners of the internet that this is happening. But I think this is, uh, you know, a thing that they're going to sort of unveil maybe in a year or so and bang that drum pretty loud, right? And then, oh, look, we're using blockchain. And then, you know, after a while, people will just not care that they're using blockchain. They'll just expect there to be this, this uh, you know, this network that, that, that's useful for trading natural gas. Um, some other efforts that are involved, uh, uh, this is, so this is not a startup I'm involved with. I'm not involved with this project, but I did, I did, uh, it did come up on my radar to sort of check it out, is they actually ran one of these, uh, these ICOs that Amber talked about, which is effectively a, a crowdfunding campaign where they, uh, you know, the, the company that's raising money issues tokens, right, uh, in order to sort of compensate, uh, you know, people for, for their, their donations to the project. Not, and oftentimes these tokens may or may not have some intrinsic value or not, again, not, not suggesting you, you buy into this at all. I'm just sort of, you know, mentioning it as a project. And their idea is to create uh, a, a sort of a, a, a renewable energy ecosystem using, using blockchain. And in this context, uh, blockchain is being used to, uh, to track energy production and also reward the, the green energy producers. This is something that's, that's sort of happening right now. Um, another one, so this is a project that I am uh, personally involved with. Um, so there's a, actually a typo here. It says transitive energy tra trading. It should be transactive energy trading. It's an autocorrect error. So transactive energy trading platform project with Hero Engineering. This is a, sort of a, maybe not a friend of mine, colleague of mine, uh, Shivam. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, he's the P CEO and uh, systems architect at Hero Engineering. And so... Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a spiel about what, what we're on about with this project. It's actually one of these classic academic industrial government partnerships. It's actually, I'm hoping it's going to work very well. Uh, Hero Engineering's mission is to take the fight to climate change by designing and implementing innovative energy conscious systems. 
Uh, Hero Engineering was founded in 2015, uh, certified to practice professional engineering in Ontario. They received uh, the Low Carbon Innovation Fund from the uh, Ministry of Ontario for developing real-time demand response communication control architectures for electrical utilities. And uh, so this is the final bit where we come in. Researchers from our blockchain lab at the Schulich School of Business are also supporting the development of this uh, new project. So what is the project? Uh, the goal of it is to uh, establish a transactive energy marketplace that incentivizes all energy stakeholders to make energy conscious decisions. Uh, the market rules that are facilitated by smart contracts, which if you recall is just simply a program that's going to be executed on a blockchain that will implement uh, and encourage the production and consumption of local green renewable energy. Uh, further incentives will be given to communities that strive to become net zero energy consumers. Uh, energy trading will be done within the communities at the building level, which I'll show in a minute, as well as between different uh, communities that are, that are sort of interconnected in a, in a wider grid. Uh, the objective of the project is sh to show how an interactive, transactive energy marketplace can lead to an overall power grid that has higher efficiency, higher resiliency, which is important, and above all is environmentally conscious. So this is a picture of uh, the Courtright Centre that's actually nor just, just north of Toronto. So it's, if you're ever going into the city, right, you can maybe stop by this Courtright Centre. It's technically in Vaughan, but it's on the way. It's just north of the 407. And uh, so the idea here is that, uh, you know, that on this, in this Courtright sort of compound, uh, there's a, a number of smart houses that are sort of wired uh, houses with all kinds of sensors in them and they're also wired to, um, I think there's a solar plant. Uh, I can never find it on this map. Oh, here, here's a little windmill, right? So there's, there's wind power. There's also a solar panel farm uh, over here at this sort of end of the compound. This, this is a parking lot over here. But uh, so this is actually, what's neat about this is this is an actual physical project that, that we're, we're, we're building out right now as opposed to a lot of projects I hear like this one I mentioned earlier right, where these guys are trying to solve all the world's problems at once, right, sort of a top-down solution for everyone, which, you know, may, may or may not make sense. We're trying to solve things in the small uh, before we solve things in the large, because if it won't work on a small scale, I, I would argue it's, it's unlikely to work on a large scale. So the idea here is that, uh, you know, we're going to have multiple uh, sort of intelligent agents that control uh, each, uh, you know, energy-producing element and, and every load element in the system. So we've got a solar array, got wind turbines and we've got some, some huts that are, that are set up there. We've also got energy storage in the, in the system. We had a great talk earlier about you know, battery storage and how that's evolving in the future. Um, you know, we've got solar arrays, uh, other houses. So, so each of these agents will, will collaborate using this, this marketplace that's implemented on the blockchain as a smart contract. We basically try to, to, to manage and, and optimize and, and control the flow of energy. I wanted to make clear here that it's not the, the blockchain is not actually transferring energy, right? The blockchain is just being used to track energy within, within a network that n no one controls. And I suppose, you know, I suppose that, you know, the, 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 it was mentioned earlier that a centralized solution is always, you know, cheaper to do and easier to do. Certainly we could just turn this over to the utility or Google or Facebook to do this, right? But for the reasons I mentioned earlier, you know, society, I think, is going to be slowly moving in this direction of like, hey, why do we need to turn over control of our lives to these, to these monolithic organizations? So this is, that's, that's where we're sort of coming from. In the future, we actually want to be able to sell back energy to the grid, to the wider grid. But my understanding is that, you know, Toronto has very aging um, sort of infrastructure there with respect to transformers. They're not able to handle, uh, you know, a, a two-way load. It's been a long time since I took, you know, transmission lines and, and, uh, and transformer theory about 15, 16 years, but that's not my end of things. My end of the blockchain. Anyway, this is a project that's ongoing right now that's actually keeping me very interested. Um, and, you know, what, on the topic of this flexible, adjustable load, right, we mentioned that, that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining, they, they burn a lot of electricity. Hmm. Hmm. On the one hand, you know, we've got this problem of sometimes in these green energy problems, we've got energy surpluses and they end up selling energy at a negative price or they just don't know how to sink it, right? They, there's just literally no way to sink it. On the other hand, we have an energy hungry technology that literally prints money. Hmm. So actually, I didn't come up with this idea. There's, there's this company called uh, Envion that I'm not associated with. They actually recently closed an ICO, again, not financial advice, uh, that uh, their, their whole thing is they put uh, cryptocurrency mining rigs, a whole series, they're basically a server farm in a container, in a shipping container, and they ship these to wherever there's green energy available. So you've got the adjustable sink basically right there. There's a little, there's a little satellite dish on the top. I don't know if folks are aware of this, but uh, since last year, the Bitcoin blockchain has been being broadcast from space on satellites. So, you know, even if governments shut down the internet, 
they also have to shut down a whole bunch of satellites in order to keep Bitcoin out. So in a sense, in a, some sense, it's kind of tough to stop. So uh, this is a project that sort of t you know, ties in well with that, right? Adjustable loads that we can drop off wherever there's energy surpluses. So again, what I'm trying to suggest, you know, based on my first slide that was a little bit apocalyptic, right, is that you know, perhaps you know, there's, there's, there's a way to balance these, these, different, these different things happening. So putting it all together, I'm almost done. I'm very well aware that I'm between us and the reception, so I'm just going to try to wrap this up real quick. Uh, another, so this is a project that I am involved with that, that's uh, actually uh, you know, really getting my you know, excitement up and, and, and passion up um, is it's, uh, it's a project called D-Life, stands for Decentralized Life, where, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, it's the project's trying to create bottom-up local economies that leverage, that leverage the blockchain. And so how does this look? Uh, you know, basically trying to create a, a token-based system for, for neighborhoods and villages, right, remote, remote sort of villages. And uh, so in here, there's a couple pieces. There's blockchain validation and mining that taps into energy production and a whole host of, uh, you know, community services that, that the intent of this project is to try to tokenize, you know, all these different community services. Sort of a holistic picture, right? How does cryptocurrency mining fit in and energy production fit into society? The idea is that we can, we can tokenize kind of everything, right? All the elements of these, of these villages. And, and why, why this actually interests me, you know, again, is this is like a real project. This is a a development that's actually taking place right now. They've broken ground. Here's the shovel. This is actually on Grand Cayman in the uh, in the in the Bahamas or in the Caribbean. So this is going to be a real project that we're going to we're going to try these things out, right? So um, you know, again, um, you know, with, as with Bitcoin, right? The the proof is going to kind of be in the pudding, right? Um, it's it's difficult to know whether any of these systems will work until we until we actually try them, right? This is a, I'm kind of a little bit skeptical myself. But, uh, you know, the, it's actually the motto of York University. Does anybody know the motto of York University? Or some people went here went to York. You guys know? You guys don't know? It's, it's the way must be tried, right? That's actually literally York's motto. And so I think this fits in kind of nice with that. Is, uh, you know, we won't know until we try this. We have to live it, right? We have to live this and see what happens. So challenges going forward. I love this slide, right? Here, here's what the thing ones that we think of, right? Bitcoin scaling, blockchain scaling was mentioned earlier. That's up here. And we've got the whole sort of bottom part down there. I want to get to that one in a minute. You know, it's Harry Potter up here. But, um, you know, uh, one big challenge actually that is, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, is sort of the lack of, of skills and training in, in blockchain technology. It's especially challenging because it is an interdisciplinary field, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary endeavor, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, again, you know, some of the work that we're doing now with, uh, with Blockchain Hub to, uh, to educate people. I, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm involved with them is I, as, a, as an instructor, as a professor, my, my highest goal is to replace myself, right, is to sort of create a new generation of young people with energy to sort of take things where, you know, you might notice I've got white in my beard, to sort of take things further, you know, beyond where, where I've been able to take things. Uh, so that's definitely one challenge, right, scaling, uh, lack of talent. Sort of another one, another big challenge that I alluded to earlier is uh, token economics, right? I say pseudoscience or magic, right? Those are sort of your two choices, really, because if you, if you think about it, I'm just sort of being honest here and, and, and realistic, is that there's very few, some of those of you that are in the know can probably point out a couple counterexamples. There's very few of these token economic systems that are actually in practice today that haven't really collapsed and failed yet, right? So we, if you go look at the news media around ICOs and token economies and this kind of stuff, there's some, uh, some scary numbers that 72% of all ICOs last year kind of are dead or have failed already, right, and only a year later. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying, <laughs> not everything, you know, so coming, coming back to my original slide here, right, the sort of the burning world here, right, so it's, it's somewhere probably in between, oh, this is too far, right, so, somewhere in between here and reality. And then, uh, so I, where I want to leave things off as well with technology is um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a quiz the class here. Uh, does anybody know what this picture is of? No takers? Take a close look. No? Panel? No? So this is actually something called a panopticon. So this is, a, this is an invention of, this is effectively a prison. I'll get to it in a minute. This is an invention of uh, Sir Jeremy Bentham, a founder of uh, UCL. I actually spent some time at UCL. If you ever go there, if you're ever in London, I would check it out. He, gave, he donated his body to science. He's sort of a forward thinker, right? He donated his body to science back in the Victorian age. He's mummified, and he actually sits in a case near the U UCL library. So if you ever get the chance, it's extremely creepy. Go, go, go check it out. I, I get nightmares, but, you know. Anyway, so what he talked about is this notion of a panopticon, which is a new kind of prison. And this, this one is actually built in Cuba, in, in, uh, in, in communist Cuba. 
And uh, before this, it was actually just sort of a thought experiment. The idea of a panopticon is that we've got a central guard tower here, and then uh, the, the cells, the prison cells, are all around the guard tower. And so the, pr the prisoners actually have no privacy at any time of the date, right? At no point in their lives in this prison do they have any privacy. And so sort of my concern as an engineer, right, so we know that dual use of technology between, you know, uh, blockchain, which is a, an immutable ledger that, you know, is unstoppable and, and uncontrollable, right? It'll sort of remember things forever. Uh, between that and IoT, right, Internet of Things, so computers are getting miniaturized, they're being put in everything, so potentially there's a way to, you know, watch us 24 hours a day. And then on top of that, we have AI, right, increasingly powerful AIs that can, you know, make decisions and keep humans out of the loop. So I'm, what I'm, my question is, like, we have to, you know, avoid creating this sort of society, right, as, uh, you know, as engineers and technologists and others, right, other people. So that, that's actually all I have. Uh, thank you, folks. Thanks, Merrick. Um, just one point before we go to open it up to questions. Uh, in my world of accounting and finance, one of the issues with particularly Bitcoin around uh, the blockchain is how do you uh, bring that blockchain information, the Bitcoin transactions, into the accounting information system, and then how do you pay tax on all the transactions that you uh, transact with Bitcoin? Because they are transactions, there is a, uh, a, a, ta a taxation element to it, and a lot of people don't even think about that. So if you bought Bitcoin at like $200 and sold it at 18000 you should be reporting it. Just, just saying. Okay, uh, open it for questions from the audience. Do you have questions for any of the panelists? Interesting question, uh, at least in my opinion. In terms of energy consumption, right? So when we use the internet, uh, when I use, for example, my device to Google something, I send it a request which is a signal, it goes, I guess, to some kind of centralized server, the signal is uh, 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 somehow uh, transformed to request, I get some uh, request, it's being sent back to me, it all requires energy, that's my point, right? The server, as you mentioned, for example, data mining, it requires a lot of power, a lot of electricity. And these uh, centralized uh, servers, uh, which we are using for internet, uh, they process our request, they send us back uh, information, they require a lot of power. As far as I understand, if we use blockchain, we, we are going to use a lot of uh, decentralized small servers, right? And uh, do you have any opinion, and it's actually a question to all panelists, if we do it globally, in terms of energy consumption, will we consume much more energy to run all these small servers or less? The funny bit to that question that comes into how centralized or decentralized is something really. And the bit when you get into mining Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these other cryptocurrencies that are reliant on a, a proof of work methodology is that you don't just have me running my little node out of my house um, with a couple of machines. You have essentially server farms that are set up where people are running thousands of machines. And so the, the question of um, if the system was designed such that uh, just small nodes were operating more independently and, and you, um, in a game theory way, designed your system so that that's what people were doing instead of running the big farms? Would that be more decentralized? Would that be more censorship resistant? Would it be more energy efficient? Yes, probably. Okay, thank you. We're not there yet. Um, <laughs> I, I do know folks are working on it. Yeah, and, and maybe to, to tail on to that a little bit, like no, not everything needs to be decentralized, right? Like some things, you know, tick along perfectly well, you know, under someone's, you know, control, right? So it, it, it's really, you know, I think in the next few years, it's really going to be a matter of you know picking and choosing which applications make make the most sense to uh, you know to sort of put up there. And I'm I'm going to come back to what I said earlier though, right? Is that you know um, you know I increasing the throughput, right? If you will, increasing the number of transactions doesn't necessarily require us to increase the amount of energy expended there, right? That, that's that's just simply the security guarantee. 
And let me emphasize uh, one thing one more uh, time. So um, a single entity monolithic application where you have a single database uh, powering everything will always be faster, more power efficient. The big thing that blockchain solves is trust. So whenever you have an interface between multiple contractors or like where, where it's not sure who should run what, that is a problem that blockchain can solve that is not solvable with a, even with a distributed uh, database that is still owned by a single entity. So I think it's not fair to compare like these monolithic applications with a blockchain because they solve different problems. But that plays into what the other speaker said before, that if you don't have this trust issue, then you shouldn't use a blockchain. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Uh, my question uh, wasn't about comparing. I'm just wondering in terms of global energy consumption, right? So on one hand, and I guess there is some trade-off. On one hand, we are using blockchain to make our energy consumption more efficient, right? On the other hand, maybe by using blockchain, we are consuming maybe more energy, more electrical power in order to run all these uh, distributed servers, right? So, so some, some applications, right, would potentially be more suited to not using proof of work, right? They still use this notion of a, a distributed ledger that no one controls, but you know, if, if you know everybody in the network, right, let's say, for example, you know, I, I know everybody in, in my community, right, we can assign you a public private key, we can assign me a public private key, we can assign all the stakeholders a public private key. And we actually at that point don't need to burn energy with proof of work. We can just basically have a, a distributed ledger among us where you know we have a more traditional uh, distributed systems view where we just simply take turns adding data to this blockchain. And if something goes wrong, if we have dishonest actors in the blockchain, that's one of the things that we're looking at with the Courtright uh, project in Vaughan is you, you still have basically an auditable ledger that you can say, oh, Merrick's cheating, right? Merrick's cheating on, you know, by adding falsehoods into the thing, and in which case people can sort of take, you know, regular recourses against those bad actors. That would be my answer Thank to you. that. That's very interesting. Thank you. I have a, a question, perhaps a, maybe a philosophical question. What is the... the the problem that blockchain is trying to solve, or what value does it add to society or societal transactions? Uh, Christian mentioned the question of uh, trust. Uh, if I can imagine if trust is completely and absolutely broken down in any society or jurisdiction or country or globally or nationally, blockchain would be kind of the perfect answer. But Today, when I take out uh, $20 out of my bank, and I know the Bank of Canada stands behind that $20, and I'll take it anywhere else, and somebody will give me equivalent to $20 worth of value, uh, why? Well, I trust in the system that exists, the institutional mechanisms that are in place to ensure that that, that transaction that I do, or millions of us do every day, are kind of legit and fair. So what's broken that blockchain is trying to, to fix to create new value for society? Uh, yes, good. Okay. Can you take that one first? And then yeah. I, I know you okay. probably want to as well. So um, let me just think. So the, the problem that blockchain is solving, like if, if you have this, this issue of trust, it's always about what kind of risk is involved if the trust is broken, right? So if there's low risk, then you probably don't need blockchain because even if something goes wrong, it's not a huge problem. But uh, especially in, in uh, our modern day and now more so than ever, information is power. So if you give a single entity all the information, then they have power over everybody who needs access to this information. And so um, if, if you have this high risk of, of valuable information that only a single entity has access to, then um, this is a huge problem that can be solved by using a blockchain where the information is distributed and nobody owns it. So for example, um, you could also imagine that countries that work together and where it's not clear who should get access to some, some information, maybe uh, about national security, um, that they could share that in a shared ledger um, without a single country having the ownership about it, of it. And maybe I'm 
Yeah, I, I think that's a very um, Canadian question, and I will say that because I've answered it for every Canadian bank executive that I've sat down with for probably about the last three years. It's a common question. Um, and I think that's okay, because that's a sign that we're, generally speaking, super lucky here. Um, I, have, I have a lot of faith in the Canadian dollar, in the, in the Canadian government, in the Canadian banking system. I'm probably not going to wake up tomorrow, um, even in a pretty bad scenario, and find that my money is gone from my account. Um, I have trust in, in that system for the most part. That doesn't stop me from being in love with Bitcoin, which I very much am, um, and I think financial sovereignty is something that is a worthy goal regardless of whether or not you have trust in the existing system. Um, but I do have relatives that came from a place where they very much could not trust the existing system, where there was absolutely persecution, uh, where they needed to escape from the financial jurisdiction where they were, where their funds were devalued, where their funds were seized by their government, where their funds could have been seized by any number of corrupt officials on the journey to Canada. And to be in a situation where now, in order to carry my wealth with me, if my wealth is in Bitcoin, I have to remember a sequence of 24 words. And I can regenerate my wallet from anywhere I am. And as long as I have that sequence, I'm fine. And no corrupt official can take that from me. No government can seize it from me. And that's an incredibly powerful tool. And I think as a society, it's naive of us to say just because we can trust the current administration that that will always be the case. Uh, I think that we should always strive for tools that give sovereignty and personal freedom to the individual. Yeah, if I could just jump on the... If I could just jump on the tail end of that. But you answered your own question, right? You said failed states. You alluded to failed states, failed economies. Uh, I think certainly, you know, especially in Canada, you know, this stability that we've been experiencing for maybe the last 50 years is, is certainly an anomaly in human history. I think I'm sure you'll agree, right, that we've had this relative stability and, and sort of level of trust that we've experienced lately. And, you know, if you pay attention to what's going on with things like quantitative easing and so forth, like, you probably won't sleep at night after that, right? So consider that. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you mentioned earlier that around 72% of all these uh, Bitcoin offerings had failed at some point. And I feel like part of the reason that is, is, you know, they're maximizing for something that's non-optimal. They're maximizing for, like, tricking people into believing they're going to offer them something down the line, or they're maximizing for a certain value they think is important now, but it was important five years ago, may not be in five years. Um, whether through regulation or even through just a blockchain-based system, through anything you can imagine, what do you think is the best way to incentivize uh, people going into blockchain base, uh, to making their own blockchain-based systems to instead um, optimize for the values that some of you guys talked about today, like uh, bottom-up economies and, and actually serving people down the line, not just now but later? How do we do that? And what should we maximize for it, really? Yeah, um, that, that's a 100% you know, valid question. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I would say that you know, it, 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 blockchain, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, all these things, is like a really very big tent. There's all kinds of folks that are in this sort of milieu. I think that the answer to your question of, as to why these have failed is probably sim simpler than you, know, you, you alluded to, is a lot of these are just simply pump and dump slash scams, right? And, and actually, you know, in the business school, I kind of recognize that, you know, the difference between a startup and a scam is, is in the heart of the founder, if you will, right? So there, externally, there's really no possible way to tell it any difference. And, and certainly, you know, I often show a video I don't have with me today of uh, Juicero. If you ever look that up, that, that's a non-ICO, non-blockchain project that came out of Silicon Valley where they were selling a $600 juicing machine which just literally squeezed juice out of a bag. And, you know, I mean, is that a scam? Is it a startup? I don't know. You decide, you judge, you, you judge. Uh, the, the other thing I'll say to that is I don't think that fail is necessarily a bad thing in some of these cases. Um, to get to true innovation, to get to progress, we have to try a bunch of stuff um, you know, before any hurdler makes it smoothly over the hurdle 
you've probably fallen on your face a whole bunch of times. And, and it's not about that. It's not about the 20, 2,500 times you fell on your face. It's about the time you figured out how to make it over smoothly and keep running. Um, and, and that's it, right? People have to try things. Um, some of those things are going to be garbage. That's OK. Um, some of them are going to be awesome. I'm not, sure that, I'm not sure that the failure rate is, a, is significantly higher than just a regular old startup, just to kind of come back to that. I don't think it's, uh, any, I don't think think it's it any worse. Yeah. Most restaurants fail in their first year, So too. I guess less about the failure rate, but more about even the ones that are succeeding. Are they succeeding for the right reasons? Are we really doing, is Bitcoin mm. really doing what it should do to push society forward? Like, and if not, what should it be doing? What should the future Bitcoin be doing? I think as long as the hype train is still going, there will always be people trying to jump on the bandwagon just because there's Bitcoin or blockchain in the name. Like, for example, recently Long Island Ice Tea uh, renamed to what is, something with blockchain. blockchain I yeah. remember or blockchain Ice Tea, and the stocks rose into uh, unimaginable heights. I, I recall they got in some trouble with the SEC because of that. <laughs> really? Okay, I didn't know that, but yeah. So. Um, yeah, as long as people just jump into it because they hear blockchain, um, we will have scams. So I think the hype needs to die first before we can think about how to properly use the technology. Again, you know, uh, analogies to the dot-com boom at the late 1990s very apt here, right? There's a lot of pets.com if you look up what that is. <laughs> look up what pets.com is. <laughs> Just on that, it seems to me that anybody that's going to buy a cryptocurrency is uh, basically going to the casino, so oh, yeah. all or nothing. I, I call it a 24-hour casino and a circus that never sleeps. Like you'll, You don't need TV anymore. <laughs> Just tune into crypto Twitter. It's, it's both hilarious and frightening and entertaining all at the same time, and informative. Okay, well, thank you for your questions, and uh, thank you to our panel for their insights into blockchain and crypto. And Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies.